This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Today, we have an in-depth discussion on the importance of a legal opinion. Sounds like pretty dry stuff? Well, it's not, because this opinion by Professor Robert McCorkadale could impact on the future of Scotland itself. And to discuss it, we're joined by the MP who commissioned it, Neil Hanvey, and Scotland's best qualified lawyer at Westminster, Joanna Cherry, KCMP. And later on in the show, we speak to independent journalist Ruth Wishart, who's also joined by the MP for Nihilin and Year, Angus Brendan McNeil. So over to Alex at Westminster. I'm now delighted to be joined by Neil Hanvey, uh, the Alapa MP for Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeef. Neil, welcome so much to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmon. Lovely to be here, Alec. I want to talk to you today about the legal process and how it impinges on politics. Uh, firstly, the, the, the Supreme Court rebuff that the, the Scottish Government suffered last year. I mean, what do you think, A, about going to the Supreme Court, and then secondly, about getting sent away with a, a flea in their ear? Well, I think there's been a, an appetite to test the constitutional law around Scotland's right to self-determination for some time uh, and uh, that's been perhaps one of the challenges that the movement has had to meet. Um, however, I think the tactics that were employed um, were misguided at, at best for a variety of reasons. First of all, I think they asked the question at the wrong time. So if there had been a live bill with the full support of the Scottish Parliament uh, and the overwhelming support of the Scottish people, uh, taking that issue to the Supreme Court is a very different proposition to asking uh, uh, the question in absence of that demonstrable support and that, that um, parliamentary strength. So I think the timing was wrong. I don't think it was particularly well argued, uh, and I think there was a variety of reasons for that, which you know, I, I, I don't think I'm necessarily qualified to speculate on, but I think that was certainly a perception generally uh, that it wasn't well argued. But you've, you've described it, I think, in an article as like akin to James IV's fatal charge at Flodden, yes. which ended up with him being killed. <laughs> yes, well, I, I, that's exactly, exactly right. So what the the net result was, as you say, the flea in the ear, was that the Scottish government were effectively told that they couldn't progress the democratic mandate that they had won uh, on a technicality of the way the UK organises itself. And, you know, it underscored very clearly that the Scottish Parliament is a creature of the UK state. And a Scottish Parliament at this moment in time in name only. So there's a, in some respects, it's instructive because it gives us a clue about what we have to do to move things forward. So the Scottish Parliament's a creature of the UK state. Does that mean that Scotland is a prisoner of the UK state? Well, yes and no. I, I think there's the answer to that. Yes, if we believe that the uh, UK state uh, is the, um, the holder of our liberty, if you like, and that no other authority uh, has a role to play in deciding that. And what uh, has transpired since then, certainly uh, underscored by the uh, Professor Robert McCorkadale's opinion, is that that, that that is not the case, that it's actually the international community and the people of Scotland who are the decision makers about the future of Scotland and its constitutional right to self-determination. 
so the rebuff though it certainly was, is there anything at all in the, uh, the Supreme Court judgment that's a, a consolation prize for Scottish nationalists or even Democrats? Well, I think what it what it does is it, it gives us a clear steer that we um, that the ballot box is the ultimate arbiter of democratic uh, expression, uh, and that that is how we advance our our case as we we move forward. That we we must use the ballot box in whichever shape or form we're able to to do. Uh, that is the the means. Yeah, this is because the Supreme Court and prayed in aid as one of its arguments for turning down the Scottish government, saying you, you can't argue as the Scottish government were doing that you can have a vote with no consequences. Yeah. So you, as a member of Parliament, recognising this difficult constitutional legal cul-de-sac that the Scottish government had led Scotland into, then did something quite interesting. You you, you sought commissioned an opinion uh, from a, a major uh, international law expert, Professor Robert McCorkadale. Well, why did you do that and why McCorkadale? Well, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the judgment, uh, I was fortunate enough to coincidentally have a Westminster Hall debate and in that debate I uh, questioned the UK government on the democratic roots to independence uh, um, from the UK government. And one of the papers that um, I reviewed as part of my research for preparation for that debate was from uh, Professor uh, McCorkadale and his reflections on how uh, international law had transformed uh, over the decades since uh, the dissolution of the, U uh, the USSR. Uh, and it was, um, it was very clear that he had a deep understanding of the issues at play and that we needed somebody with that um, uh, level of uh, forensic understanding of the issue and not least uh, a tremendous unimpeachable uh, international reputation uh, to give us an opinion and so that was the the thinking behind taking it forward with Professor McCorkadale. And of the, you know, his long and considered uh, opinion, yeah. uh, what, what aspects of it give you most hope as pointing a way forward uh, for Scotland? Uh, I think the the most important uh, element of that is his very clear and precise statement that as a people, the people of Scotland have a right to self-determination and that that right should not be impeded or interfered with by the state, that it's for the people to decide, not the state. So for me, that is uh, as clear an instruction to the UK government as you can get that this is the business that is really none of their concern and they should do everything they can to facilitate that democratic expression. You say that the UK has a, a, a duty to facilitate, but surely it would be expecting too much uh, to, for the, the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to, to facilitate the means by which Scotland can, can exit the state. Well, I think when I say facilitate, all they really have to do is not obstruct, not obstruct the democratic expression of the people of Scotland and to enable a vote such as the one that took place in 2014 uh, to go ahead under the same terms as were uh, agreed back then. Uh, the notion uh, that the Supreme Court put forward that the UK state has some role to play in uh, approving the right of the people of Scotland to have a vote uh, is absolute nonsense and that has been clearly set out by Professor McCorkadale. Yes, I suppose if, if every predecessor state had to give permission yeah. for people to exercise the right of self-determination then the numbers of countries in the United Nations wouldn't have grown from around 50 <laughs> to around 200. Indeed. So does it frustrate you, you're a practicing politician does it frustrate you that we're having a legal argument about, in effect, whether Scotland is really a nation or not? Uh, if you could go into the, the streets of Scotland and sort of take a, an opinion poll, are we a nation or not? Yeah. Uh, then the result would be overwhelming. So how much frustration is it that you can get eminent lawyers who actually effectively are debating whether Scotland, Scotland is a real nation? Yeah. Well, I, I think the the judgment from McCorkadale makes it clear that the people of Scotland are a people for the purposes of self-determination and therefore 
all of that historic context is set out clearly within that particular part of the, the opinion. Um, but the notion that uh, Scotland is not a nation is risible. Uh, uh, and I think you're, you're absolutely spot on that no one in the right mind would accept that that is indeed the case. And of course, in many senses, you have, uh, as a member of parliament, uh, as an Alapa member of parliament, have the, the only game in town at the present moment, because yeah. you have, uh, in going through its, uh, albeit slowly and all li albeit likely to be blocked, going yeah. through its commons process, is a, a self-determination bill. So, I yeah. mean, what's that about? Well, uh, all it really does, I mean, it's a very short bill, it's very straightforward uh, in, uh, in the facility that it provides Scotland is uh, an equitable facility to the one that is afforded to the people of Ireland uh, to consider their constitutional future, that they would be able to hold a referendum if supported in a democratic vote once uh, every seven years, if it was supported every seven years, uh, a referendum on the constitutional future. Uh, and I think that if you look back into the McCorkadale opinion, uh, there's a, an element in there which talks about the equal opportunity and equality of opportunity to express uh, the, the desire for self-determination uh, is something that I think is a, an important point to highlight in the UK. How can it be that certain people in the UK have more rights about their self-determination than others? If I lived in Northern Ireland, I would have a right every seven years within the constitutional law of the UK to have a say on my future constitutional arrangement. In Scotland, I'm denied that. That's wrong. When you were introducing a bill, uh, were you aware of the sort of weight of history of the huge, distinguished politicians who'd gone down that path before you? Uh, yes, uh, I think when you look back into Hansard, particularly historically, and you see the voices uh, of people, uh, you know, historical figures of great stature, uh, echoing the sentiments that you're about to argue. It really is, it's quite a humbling experience. Uh, it, it really is very special. So where does all this legal uh, debate and opinions uh, leave Scotland in democratic terms? I mean, how, how do we find the means of, of allowing people in Scotland the, the, the right to express themselves as far as the self-determination of their country and the independence of their country is concerned? Well, it has to be through the ballot box, whether that's a Scottish general election or a UK general election. And the message has to be absolutely clear. So um, that's why a Scotland United ticket, which unites all of the independent supporting parties, is the right way. Uh, that Once that mandate is secured, that there is a very clear strategic march towards independence and the negotiation of those terms. The Scotland United for Independence concepts whereby the various independence parties, SNP, Alapa, Green Party, Scottish Socialists, maybe some independents, stand under the banner Scotland United for yeah. Independence. But the crucial thing is with a, a manifesto commitment to say this is a, a test of Scotland's wish for independence. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have to also um, make it clear to the UK government that these rules can and should apply to every future general election. Uh, that's a, a completely legitimate uh, democratic uh, act action to take, to, to make that explicit commitment to the people of Scotland and to give them that opportunity to express their, their views in that way. But one of the other side issues from the uh, Supreme Court judgment, of course, was that uh, um, the, it, the limitations placed upon the Scottish Parliament and recognised by uh, Professor McCorkadale was that they may not be, the Scottish Government may not be the correct body uh, to um, make uh, any political decision about secession or UDI or any of those and types that of That points the way to something like a constitutional convention after a ballot box mandate, how yes. do you enforce that, gather people together who've got the, the mandate to point the way forward domestically and of course internationally. Yeah, and, and that really I think underscores the importance of a Scotland United ticket at the front end of this where no single political entity is seen to be the arbiter of Scotland's right to self-determination because you will coalesce around 
that independence convention, that Scottish convention, who will then be the, uh, the, the decision makers uh, and the messengers of Scotland's uh, right to self-determination to the UK government and the international community. So final question, Neil Henry, yeah. you've, uh, you've pursued the constitutional case in the, the hallowed halls of the, the Westminster Parliament. Uh, do you see you uh, yourself in an independent Scottish Parliament taking the, the, the benefits of independence uh, to the people? Well, uh, nothing would give me uh, greater pleasure or would be a greater honour to bestow on me to, 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 to be in that place when a true Scottish Parliament is reconvened and I just hope and pray that that will happen in my lifetime. So in uh, the words of uh, the great Winifred Ewing, you're, you're down here to, to settle up, not to settle down. Absolutely, 100% Alec. <laughs> Neil Handy, thank you so much for, for joining me in Scotland Speaks with Alex Sam. Pleasure. Coming up after the break, Alex is joined by Joanna Cherry, KCMP, to further discuss Professor McCorkadil's opinion and its impact on the future of Scotland itself. We'll see you then. Hello, I'm Bernard Ponsonby. Remember to secure your tickets for The Eyes Have It, which will be playing at the Spiegel Tent on the Fringe from the 4th to the 13th of August. It'll be rough, it'll be tough, but it will also be a good laugh. So get your tickets for The Eyes Have It. The Eyes Have It. Welcome back. Alex is joined at Westminster by the MP for Edinburgh South West, Joanna Cherry KC. I'm now delighted to be joined by a distinguished KC in the, the House of Commons, Joanna Cherry, the Member of Parliament for Edinburgh South West. Joanna, welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmon. Thank you for having me. Now, you're a distinguished lawyer. Uh, you know more than most about the interaction between the law and politics. You laid the proud usurper law in the Supreme Court on Brexit. So you know, tell us a bit about that and how the law can impinge on the political process. Well, I think the, uh, the defeat of Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom Supreme Court over the unlawful prorogation of Parliament was a defeat made in Scotland because, of course, there were two cases that challenged the lawfulness of the prorogation. But the English case fell at the first hurdle, but the Scottish case, which I spearheaded, was won unanimously in the inner house of the court session, that's Scotland's appeal court. And that really breathed new life into the arguments and gave the springboard for the victory we had at, this, at the UK Supreme Court. So that had a dramatic effect in, in politics. I mean, that was Lady Hale's uh, yep. Supreme Court. I mean, Lord Reid's Supreme Court hasn't been as kind to uh, uh, the Scottish argument. Well, I think Lady Hale's Supreme Court was rather more adventurous and expansionist on the constitutional front. The Supreme Court under Lord Reid is widely recognised as having retrenched somewhat and being rather more conservative with a small c. And that's not just my view, that's a view held by commentators on the right like Jonathan Sumption and commentators on the left like Professor Conor Geerty of the London School of Economics. And just because uh, Lord Reid and his colleagues are, are frightened from the guns that are being trained on them by Downing Street? Well, I'd like to think that's not the answer. Different judges have different approaches, but I think perhaps the backlash against the judiciary throughout the Brexit process has made uh, the Supreme Court perhaps pull its horns in a bit, and some would say that that was uh, eminently predictable after Lady Hale left. So we are where we are. Is there anything at all in that Supreme Court rebuff to the Scottish Government of last year that you could pray and aid and help a democratic case? Well, two things. Um, part of the judgment, I think it's paragraph 81, uh, recognises the huge political significance that a democratic vote for independence would have. Now, it does so very much in the context of a lawful referendum, um, but those who support a de facto referendum at an election might want to pray that in aid. You could also look at the question of whether um, a body other than the Scottish Parliament, which of course is very much a creature of 
the statute, the Scotland Act, a body that's not the creature of that act and not bound by its limitations could organise and hold um, a referendum in Scotland. No reason why that wouldn't be lawful. There's no rule of the British Constitution, unlike the Spanish Constitution, that uh, Scotland cannot secede from uh, the Union. And, and that brings me to my second point about the judgment. Before the Supreme Court judgment, nobody seriously questioned that Scotland had the right to self-determination. But there's rather a curious passage in the Supreme Court's judgment towards the end where they suggest that Scotland doesn't have the right to self-determination. Now, when I read that, I felt it was instinctively wrong, but I'm by no means an expert in international law. But of course, an opinion has been obtained from an expert in international law. This is the opinion by, commissioned by Neil Hanvey yes. uh, from Professor Robert McCorkadale. Yes. In many ways, the United Nations' favourite international lawyer. Yes, I mean, this is a very eminent uh, international legal expert who says the Supreme Court are wrong and that Scotland does have the right to self-determination. And I think part of what happened in the Supreme Court was that the point wasn't argued properly. There were no oral submissions on it. It was an issue that was raised by the intervention on behalf of the Scottish National Party, but not properly debated in front of their lordships. And I don't see that part of the judgment as being binding. But I find uh, Professor McCorkadale's opinion very interesting. I think he correctly identifies that Scotland, like all the other nations of the world, as you might expect, has the right to self-determination. But he also sets out very realistically the difficulties inherent in trying to realise that right as a matter of international law. He says difficult but not impossible. Indeed. And, and cites a, a number of previous examples. Do you think the, the International Court of Justice, which is, is that, is that a, a route which uh, should be explored at well, least by, uh, by the Scottish government? As I understand what Professor McCorkadale is saying, in order for Scotland to plead its case in front of the International Court of Justice, there would have to be majority support from the United Nations General Assembly and an existing member state of the United Nations would have to support Scotland's case. I don't see that happening at the moment. But in future, if there were to be a clear democratic expression of the will of the Scots that they supported independence by a majority, i.e. an opposite result from the 2014 independence referendum, then certainly that is an avenue that exists. Another interesting thing that uh, Professor McCorkadale says is he says that uh, to unilaterally declare, for a nation to unilaterally declare its independence is not unlawful but it needs to be underpinned again by a democratic vote. And again here we come up against the difficulty that we had a vote against independence in 2014. We have to find a way to use the ballot box to uh, demonstrate that the weight of opinion has changed in Scotland and that, and that a majority now support independence. Now, I've never been an advocate uh, of unilateral declarations of independence because as Professor McCorkadale says, they only succeed if they get international recognition. But what I think is really important about Professor McCorkadale's opinion is that it knocks on the head the idea that Scotland doesn't have the right to self-determination and looks at the issue of how Scotland might secede from the Union from a much broader perspective than just the narrow prism of the devolved statute. The, the devolved settlement, devolution's barely 25 years old. The union's more than 300 years old. Devolution cannot have the last word on how Scotland can become independent. It's interesting, if you took Lord Reid and his Supreme Court uh, to any Scottish street and allowed them to ask the denizens of that street, is Scotland a real nation? Does Scotland have the right to decide its own future? Then you wouldn't be talking about a a 50% support for that, you'd be talking 90% support or more. So how can you have a legal system which is so removed from the, the people's feelings? Well, legal systems aren't about people's feelings. Legal systems are about uh, applying the law, but I think you're absolutely correct. I think the vast majority of people in Scotland, be they unionist or nationalist, would think that Scotland is a nation with the right to self-determination. Uh, I think what went wrong in the UK Supreme Court is that this issue of self-determination 
was raised in a written intervention by the Scottish National Party, but not properly argued. And I think the Supreme Court got it wrong because they weren't favoured with the full arguments that they would have had if they'd heard oral submissions. Um, but, you know, the United Kingdom Supreme Court is not the final arbiter of whether, as a matter of international law, Scotland has a right to self-determination. And I think it's good that we've got an opinion, a legal opinion from such a, a well-respected international lawyer that says that. So if, as you say, we, there needs to be a, a way to test the democratic position, uh, in the absence of the devolved parliament being able to organise such a referendum, there's only two other options, isn't there? One is to have somebody else do it, uh, and secondly is to use elections to provide that democratic test. Uh, is that correct? And which one do you favour? I think that is correct. Um, I've always, f I mean, I've always favoured, if you were going to have a de facto referendum, I've always favoured uh, using um, a Scottish parliamentary election because of the franchise which includes uh, European citizens and refugees and new Scots who've been given the vote in Scotland and uh, mm, also... 16-year-olds. Exactly. <laughs> well, you were the author of that. You know, 16-year-olds. And so I think it's a broader and fairer franchise. But you might come up against the argument that because it's an election for the Scottish Parliament, the creature of statute, it can't, its view on whether or not Scotland should be an independent nation can't be the final word on that. So if that, that argument might lead me to prefer a British general election, but the problem with general elections is very difficult to turn them into a de facto referendum on something because so many issues come into play at a general election. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if you win, your opponents will say, oh, they, it was about a lot of other things. But if you lose, your opponents will say, oh, it was about independence and that's it off the table for a generation. Um, so I think I'm not going to say which uh, of those options I favour because the way to work out what the best way to go is to have a proper debate about this. And this is why I have been so frustrated over the last few years in the Scottish National Party is because of the lack of proper debate and deliberation about strategy and policy. And I hope that's going to change under our new leadership. Uh, and in that debate that you're looking forward to under the, the new leadership of the, of the SNP, are you hoping that the, the idea of a, a Scotland United framework for contesting the Westminster election might be something that's uh, considered and the advantages explored? Yes, I've already written about this in my national column and said that the idea of Scotland United it should be considered. Uh, I think it's a kind of a win-win from the SNP's point of view, um, it would, because the SNP obviously holds the majority of seats at the moment. We would contest all the seats that we hold, and in recognition of our dominance, the majority of the other seats and then other smaller independence supporting parties or indeed uh, pro-independence uh, candidates might come forward. Now, understandably, there's resistance to this in the SNP and it's not something that I'll be supporting as an SNP politician unless the party gets behind it, but I think the party should be debating it. And finally, Joanna Cherry, as an eminent lawyer coming into politics, does that make you more conscious of the fact that, 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 that political arguments are finally determined politically within a legal framework, uh, as opposed to the belief that somehow you can have a, a legal judgment that, that takes your politics. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, I've always said, <clears throat> there's no legal shortcut to independence. The law can inform our strategy, and it's important to get the fullest and the best advice about the law from someone who's signed up to the project, but nevertheless gives advice as a lawyer rather than as a politician. But ultimately, whether or not Scotland becomes independent is a political question that will be uh, determined by the ballot box. Joanna Cherry, distinguished Casey, thank you so much for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Alex Sargent. Thank you.
here in our capital city of Edinburgh for Edinburgh Castle behind us and in the Spiegel tent during the festival I'll be presenting the most important argument for independence you've ever heard. The final clinching argument. If you remember nothing else, then just remember this. Mr. Salmon, your time is up. You'll just have to buy a ticket. Welcome back. Now, last week, we took a look at the end of parliamentary terms at both Westminster and Holyrood. In Westminster, Baroness Helena Kennedy and Steve Richards had these words of warning for Sir Keir Starmer and Cabinet Secretary Simon Case, respectively. And I think Keir Starmer is trying too hard to be defined by Tony Blair, uh, copying Tony Blair's language, copying a strategy from a different era. And I can't think of a political project which is successful that has copied an earlier one. And, I, and I, my disappointment in him is that I, I d didn't think he was uh, equipped for the, the role. Um, I, I thought it was a strange appointment. But, but, of course, you've got to remember he was appointed because they didn't want a proper civil servant um, uh, who would, would really um, hold the reins. And Simon Case, I, I actually think, during the whole of COVID, where was he? What was he doing? Why have we not had? I mean, Robin I Butler. I think he attended parties. If well, I, I, and I think he, I think he probably did. And I think that he's a very lucky man that he too hasn't been fined and uh, and dealt with by the police. And from our Scottish correspondents, Paul Sinclair had these words of warning for Labour and the Tories, and Fergus Much these words of warning for the SNP. I can't tell you what a Labour Scotland looks like. I certainly don't know what a Labour a Conservative Scotland looks like. And I think um, the, there needs to be a much better offer from uh, the opposition parties than there is at the moment. You need to steady the ship in government. Um, at, but ultimately, if you want to affect change, you need to campaign for it. And the SNP hasn't done a hell of a lot of that. And now to your response to that show and the many messages, tweets and emails you sent to us. First... Bobby Livingston says, as a son of the Shaws, it's great to hear Helena Kennedy articulate the deep concerns one has about the blistering attacks on democracy, and especially so those directed in Scotland's direction by a parliament we have utterly rejected. On Helena, Art Deco Lady says, she's far too kind to Starmer. As long as he and Streeting are receiving money from private healthcare providers, they have no interest in bringing the NHS back under public control. Starmer is a neoliberal. I'm delighted to note this week that we have some followers and viewers from outside Scotland. Mauro Vianney from Italy says, Scotland deserves home rule, nothing less, even if it might be considered little less than independence. New Zealand and other countries became fully independent in the British constitutional context, little by little, through home rule laws. And then Abdul Ghaffar from Bangladesh says, excellent, of last week's show. Chrisium says, another good show, and Mary says, another excellent show, really enjoyed it. Ian says, another excellent show by his Ekness. And Trish McPherson says, love the section on Marie de Guise. I can see why our culture has been erased from our children's history and education. Can't have those unruly Scottish women knowing we've always had heroines to look to and inspire us as a force for good. Ain't that right, Trish? And thank you very much indeed for all your messages. Do keep writing in because we're very keen to hear your opinions on what we've covered so far and indeed get your ideas for what we could cover in shows in the future. But now we are over to Alex and his favourite part of the show, Scotland's Hidden Heroes in association with iScot magazine. If you're around uh, Waverley Station in Edinburgh uh, and take a, a glance up towards Calton Hill, you'll see a rather imposing obelisk, uh, which is actually a monument to the person we're going to talk about today, to him and to four of his colleagues who were banished to Australia back in the, the 1790s. Because that person is Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill. Not exactly a hidden hero in the sense that he's 
well known among researchers and people who study Scottish history, but not nearly as known as he should be, given the importance of Muir as a historical figure. He is a, a fascinating figure, almost a contradiction in terms, in that he started off his professional life as a mildly reforming advocate and ended up as a, a revolutionary plotting the overthrow of the, the state and an invasion of Scotland by French forces to establish a Scottish Republic. So what happened to turn Muir from a mild reformer to an out-and-out -out revolutionary? Well, basically what happened was the oppressive power of the state. Because after Muir graduated in the late 1780s <clears throat> as an advocate and was enrolled into the Faculty of Advocates, he started to represent common people. He had a social conscience. He became a friend of the people, the reforming organization who wanted to extend the, the, the franchise. And what happened to him then was that the power of the establishment started to bear down upon him. And that establishment was in the, the form of what we can call a despicable duo. That is Robert Dundas, uh, who was Lord Advocate, the, the nephew of Henry Dundas, who ran Scotland for Pitt the Younger, and Lord Braxfield, a notorious judge uh, whose use of broad Scots did nothing to mitigate the sentences he handed out to unfortunates. Braxfield was Scotland's equivalent of uh, Judge Jeffreys. He was a, a hanging judge, uh, except that his favourite sentence was deportation, banishment to Australia of any person who had a semblance of radical thought. Braxfield famously uh, said to a, a reformer who had the misfortune to appear before him and suggested that Christ himself had been a bit of a reformer, uh, Braxfield replied, when muckle get it did him, he was hang it. That's the sort of piece of work we're dealing with. Uh, so that uh, infamous duel combined uh, to send uh, Muir and some of his fellow radicals uh, to Australia. It was a case that provoked substantial controversy. People could sense there was a huge injustice being done. Robert Burns in Ayrshire, writing Scots Wahe, noted that uh, uh, the, the poem referred to things ancient and things much more recent, referring on to the Muir trial. So Muir ended up in Australia, and there the story might have ended. His fellow radicals who were similarly banished and died of disease or were lost to, to history and posterity. Uh, but Muir was made of uh, sterner stuff. He, he managed to get on a, an American ship. He escaped from uh, Botany Bay. He ended up in California. He went from California to Mexico to Cuba. He was all the time trying to get back to Scotland. His uh, boat back to Spain was intercepted by a British uh, frigate. Half his face was uh, uh, blown off. Uh, and yet, by one means or another, because he was admired by many people, the person, Thomas Muir, who had become the most wanted man in the world, sought everywhere by the, the British forces, uh, somehow contrived to get to revolutionary France, where he was greeted as a hero of the revolution. He had the equivalent of a ticker tape parade through the, the streets of Paris uh, as they uh, celebrated this radical Scotsman. Uh, and Muir by this time, and given his experiences hardly surprisingly, uh, a thoroughgoing full-scale revolutionary, spent his last days in France in Chantilly plotting the overthrow of the British government and the establishment of a Scottish Republic, because by then, due to repression and the fear, of course, of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, then the friends of the people had turned into the United Scotsman. Muir's uh, story could uh, could grace any book, and an excellent book has recently been written by, by Murray Armstrong, but it could also be the most amazing film, an amazing feature. His story should be on the lips of every young Scot who wants to admire somebody of bravery, of diligence, of conscience, and also who was very thrawn because it was his thrawnness that turned him from a mild reformer into an out-and-out -out revolutionary. That and the oppression of the establishment. So what's the lessons that Muir teaches? Sometimes he's called the father of Scottish democracy. He certainly had an influence in future events because the obelisk which I referred to was erected 50 years later. When people looked to Muir and the radicals of the 1790s for inspiration in the battles which were then to come, 
uh, for the franchise, for democracy, for representation. Only recently, Muir's name was restored to the, the role of the Faculty of Advocates, thanks to the work of uh, uh, Ross McFarlane KC, and uh, admitted back by the then Dean of the, the Faculty, Gordon Jackson. <laughs> A remarkable period of time. Of course, Muir's been long dead and won't be able to practice, but nonetheless, uh, historic injustice was corrected. But Muir's wish and belief for emancipation, for representation, for Scottish nationals, which was also one of his guiding stars, stands him out in the 18th century as one of the, the great figures of Scottish history. A hero whose uh, light has been uh, hidden under a bushel, but a hero whose name should be on the lips of every young Scot. So let's leave the, the very last words to those of Muir himself. I've devoted myself to the cause of the people, it is a good cause. It shall ultimately prevail. It shall finally triumph. And so it shall. How does a legal opinion translate into practical campaigning? And indeed, how does it impact on independent strategy. Well, to discuss this, Alex is joined in the crossfire section of our show by Ruth Wishart, journalist and commentator, and also by a very much in the news MP, the MP for Nihilin and Year, SNP rebel, Angus Brendan McNeil. So Ruth and Angus, welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thank Hi you. There. Can I turn to you first, Ruth? You know, th this opinion from Robert McCorkadale, very learned, very useful, I think, for the national movement, but how much political, practical effect does it have having a, a legal opinion such as this? Well, I think it's very useful that somebody of his stature would have um, pointed the finger at the Supreme Court and suggested that they got it wrong in their judgment. I mean, that's always good to hear. But in terms of a practical effect, I can't see it's going to make one blind bit of difference. I mean, the one thing I've learned over the years is that if you keep... Um, you know, keep begging for a Section 30 order on bended knee, all you get is very sore knees. Angus McNeil, what about your opinion of the McCorkadale opinion? I mean, I think uh, the practical effect depends on how it's deployed. And, you know, that then goes into the realms of political argument. Uh, and I think it's good to have up your sleeve. It's a very useful thing. And as Ruth said, uh, it shows that the, the Supreme Court of the UK isn't divinely ordained. Uh, it's a collection of people, yes, very learned, uh, but over and above that, I think probably as Ruth ultimately says, uh, it depends if argument falls in and around where the Supreme Court is. Um, and I would say, you know, the Supreme Court said what it said, but it also said something very interesting in its own, in its own judgment in paragraph 81. Uh, and it's from there that I see more argument and more debate uh, than the one refuting it, because I think actually the Supreme Court uh, provided its own route uh, to show where Scotland can go. Well, you've got us all hanging on here with bated breath, Angus. Tell us what paragraph 81 said. Are people at demonstrations going to be shouting paragraph 81? Hopefully they will. If they all read paragraph 81, then they might well be. Uh, I mean, paragraph 81 basically said why the Supreme Court couldn't allow uh, the devolved parliament to hold a referendum. It wasn't so much the referendum, it was the consequences of that referendum, in that the referendum could bring about changes uh, related to the United Kingdom Parliament. And therefore, with those powers uh, retained at Westminster, you couldn't actually cause, uh, you couldn't be given the powers to hold that referendum. Uh, although they said it would have uh, no legal, immediate legal consequences, and even if the UK government had not given any political commitment to act upon it, they pointed out that, that it would have an authority in any culture or, and political culture founded upon democracy. So ultimately, going back to McCorkey, going back to the Supreme Court, paragraph 81 ultimately shows what rules here, and what rules here is democracy. And ultimately, if the people vote for something, the people will get it. Now, we can scare them and tell them, oh, you know, you can't because it's not legal or whatever. Law will follow democracy. Democracy is the, is the king here. And do you agree with that, Ruth? Democracy is king? 
Yeah, I absolutely do. And I think, yeah, you know, further than that, that democracy delayed is democracy denied to um, to um, misquote an old, an old uh, saw. But, you know, I'm not at all sure why we're bothered that much about the Supreme Court. I'm getting guy fed up with them, um, you know, going with a begging bowl to vote like the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, as far as I'm concerned, is nothing more or less than a kind of pinnacle of the legal establishment for them down there. I don't see what port what particular relevance it has for Scotland. I want Scotland to get up off its knees and I, and get on with it, frankly. But in defence of the Supreme Court, which puts me in an unusual position, it was actually the Scottish government who went to ask their opinion. Yes, I know, and I, I, I regret that because I, I think, you know, we, we've done that once before and got, and got given our jotters pretty smartly. So I don't think there was any chance that the Supreme Court was going to look kindly on anything coming from the Scottish Government or indeed anybody else whose um, future aspiration is independence for Scotland. It's just that I, I've got a strong feeling that, you know, poll after poll after poll tells us that the majority of Scots are still in favour of independence. Now, that, that goes across all parties. I'm not making a plea for any one particular party. I think there is a groundswell of fairly solid opinion in favour of independence in Scotland. And we've really got to take that, um, you know, flood. Um, we've got to take that tide at the flood. We've got to get on with it when we've still got that um, rather large um, group of people who are still in favour of, of independence. And I'm really in favour of everybody of an independent mind in Scotland getting together and pursuing that shared aim. So Angus McNeil, if perhaps not everyone in Scotland or hardly anyone is going to read either the Supreme Court judgment or the McCorkadale opinion, but there's still an essence of, of sense uh, behind McCorkadale because if you went to the, the streets of Scotland from Barra to Barheed, uh, and ask people, is Scotland a real nation or not? Does it have the right of self-determination? Should it decide its own future? You'd get a pretty overwhelming answer, regardless of people's political preferences. Yeah, and that, <clears throat> I think that's the important bit. Should Scotland decide its own future? And Scotland should decide its own future. Uh, I mean, self-determination becomes loaded in other things of colonialism and what have you. But should Scotland decide its own future? Yes. Uh, and I think this Scottish government were... I've called it clueless uh, when they went to the Supreme Court. I mean, what happened yeah, inside... That got you into a bit of trouble, did it not, uh, Angus McNeil? The, the, the clueless word seems to have been taken exception to. Well, it was clueless. Uh, and and that, so that was very obvious. It was it was announced to us uh, as a group of MPs that this was happening. Uh, there was no debate around it in the same way that uh, when the idea of using elections was described as being incredibly daft by the former First Minister in a quote... Uh, then she then announced it a few months later uh, in the parliament. There was no, there was no strategy going through this. And the worst bit, I think, was okay. They went to the Supreme Court, and they could have built up the public and had unbelievable seriousness about their intentions by passing legislation at Holyrood, making the public expectation rise. And then the Supreme Court going against the public would have been difficult for them. Uh, but afterwards, there was no strategy. And there was no strategy until there was going to be some conference, special conference early in the new year, which was then then came out, it was 25% through the new year. It was going to be in March. And the first minister resigned and it didn't happen. And then there was something in Dundee, which was a talking shop. But around there, uh, the first minister made his own several announcements of what he thought. And perhaps nothing will be resolved until SNP conference in October, which will be about 11 months after the Supreme Court. So that thing comes back to the point of believable seriousness. If the people from Barra to Bar Head, as he put it, are believe that the government and those leading are serious, then they will step up to the mark themselves. But people have a lot going on in their lives. And if we are not giving them something that's believable and serious, people are not going to properly engage. We'll engage, me, you and Ruth, we'll engage. But, you know, I can't keep my neighbours engaging about it. And I was discussing this on a Saturday night, unless there's a reason for them to actually engage and to believe there's other things going on in life and they're not going to waste years if we're dilly-dallying. And we've got an opportunity. We can do this. There's an early Holyrood election. We could stop the world while Scotland decides to get on or not uh, if we wanted to. Uh, we could use a Westminster election, but we've got to be believable and we've got to be serious and we can uh, push this agenda on. Rufa, I see you nodding. Is that where you stand now? Use the first available ballot box opportunity to seek a mandate? It's not so much that about that. I mean, I'm, I'm not all that enthused about plebiscite elections either, to be honest with you. But I do think that Angus is absolutely correct in one aspect, which is 
that um, we have to have something to let people get their teeth into. We have to have something around which you can rally. I mean, I happen to think that Keir Stammer has blown it in Scotland by um, by being against everything that the but that folk in Scotland are for. And I th I don't think that's any way for him to steal seats from uh, from independence warriors. But I, and I also because I'm chronologically gifted, as we both know, Alec. Um, I remember when um, we we decided that the, so the, the the Scottish people were sovereign. I remember being there when we decided that the Scottish people were sovereign and I've seen nothing since then that's made me change my mind that we are sovereign and if we're sovereign then we have to decide and we have to want it enough. Now there's only one demographic which is still saying no and it happens to be my demographic and I can't wait to get on the road to go and bash a few heads together. Well I can't resist saying but didn't we decide the Scottish people were sovereign in our in 1320? We, we, we surely both <laughs> weren't there. I don't go back quite that far. I was thinking, I was thinking more of the the claim of right days. But I'll, I bow to your superior chronology. I mean, I think one of the things that I can say is, you know, yeah, a referendum is, has been our preference. But if a referendum is blocked, we can use the same ballot boxes on the same voters on perhaps the same days to ask to to get the people to answer a question, and the question could be an independence. And the Supreme Court did say uh, the reasons for blocking a referendum was a clear outcome, whichever way the question was answered, would possess the authority in a constitution and political culture founded upon democracy of a democratic expression of the view of the Scottish electorate. Now, if we get that democratic, that expression uh, in an election, I mean, I've spoken to a number of Tory and Labour MPs who say, yeah, fine, you can have it. Well, I, I you know, it seems to me that... Uh... We, we're we only going to get where we want to, to go to if we get a real head of steam up uh, among, across Scotland. As Angus says, people in Scotland have got a lot on their plate just now and, there, and, and it's always the, the refrain, the mantra from the opposition parties in Scotland. They're always saying, how could you possibly talk about independence when everybody's in such a, a bind with with energy costs and cost of living and all of that stuff? And I get all that. I really do get all that. But but what we've got to persuade people, the ones that are with us and the ones that will be with us, is that actually the only way out of all of these binds is to do our own thing, is to have a government which we can respect, to have a government which we can follow, to have a government which is on the same page in terms of social justice. I don't see any other parties in the opposition parties that, that are following that that script at the moment. And, and I think that I think people are not, you know, people are not daft. If they get something they can rally around. If they get a lead, a proper lead taken, if they get a proper campaign going, they'll, they'll get there. They'll come out and they'll come out in their thousands. And as I said, it's only one demographic so far that at this point that we have to convince. And I'm definitely up for trying to convince them. So let's take us to a situation where the Scottish uh, government, the parties of independence, singly or collectively, have appealed for a mandate to negotiate independence and are trying to rally support behind that concept. How, how best would that be done to enforce a, a mandate or a, expressing Scotland's uh, sovereignty, Angus McNeil? Well, I, th I think that, that enforcing that mandate wouldn't be that difficult because if we accept it in Scotland, this is the first community that has to accept it. And I hear a lot of talk about the international community as an abstraction, and it is an abstraction. You know, if we think back to 2014, Alec, you may remember that the Icelandic government in particular were keen to be the first to recognize us as they had recognized many of the former Soviet states. Um, but we were at the time talking, I think it was me, you and Angus Robertson, who talked about the UK government should get that honor first uh, and from Westminster. But once we recognize it, there is not a Democrat anywhere or anybody inside democratic culture who isn't going to recognize it. So we, we then march on from there. I mean, there's there are some... In our in our organisation or in our in our uh, movement, who say, yeah, I believe in Scotland's right to self determination, but only if Westminster agrees. Now, it's it's really getting carts and horses in an awful tangle. Westminster will agree, and I've spoken to enough of them. And actually, Rich, Rishi Sunak, I've asked him personally at the liaison committee, and I think one of the journalists at STV asked him as well. You know, if the Scottish people were to vote for independence at the uh, at an election or any ballot box event, would you oppose it? And he pointedly dodged saying he would oppose it. He, of course, tried to give some sucker to those who said, oh, it's very difficult, so don't try. And the reason that there's that he wouldn't give a Section 30 for a referendum is because he doesn't want the answer to the question, and he can block the question. But if the question is ever answered and we put the question, 
he won't block the answer then. He block, might block the question now, but he won't block the answer then, and nobody will. The only people who might have trouble with it are those of the of the sort of uh, views of Putin and Lukashenko, those who don't believe in the ballot box. But for the rest of civilized, democratic world, it will be fine, and Scotland will move on from that point. Is that a reasonable summary, Ruth Wishart? The, 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 to misquote an English poet, that the, the fate lies not in the stars or Westminster, but actually in ourselves. I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, we, it's, it's democracy is the key, as Angus says. Democracy and, and Democrats are the key to wh where we're all trying to get to. It's been clear for a long time, I think, that um, there's a democratic deficit in Scotland. And this is not grievance politics. I mean, it's, it's awfully easy for folk to say, well, there they go again. It's just more grievance. Everything is Westminster's fault. No, everything is not Westminster's fault. A lot of it is our fault. We have to have the bottle, the spine, the backbone and the determination to go to the destination we want. It, what is stopping Scottish independence at the moment isn't actually Westminster. It's the MSPs at Holyrood who haven't got them themselves together uh, to, put, to put a motion, either in majority or two-thirds, uh, to give an early election on independence. And that could have happened after the Supreme Court. And that was quickly quashed wrongly and misleadingly by the former First Minister when she said the only way to do that was through the resignation of the First Minister. And then it risked wrongly again that uh, Douglas Ross could become First Minister. It can be done with two-thirds, or it can be done by changing the two-thirds rule to a simple majority. Um, so, you know, Ruth is absolutely correct. And unless we are serious, and unless we take these matters in our hands, given we can't have a referendum, there are other ways, but if we don't touch, start talking about them, and back to the point of believable seriousness, if we don't have believable seriousness, we will carry on moaning about the two-child policy, carry on putting out press releases about whatever else Westminster is doing that's against Scotland's democratic interests, as Ruth says. This doesn't happen in normal countries like Ireland, in Norway, in Iceland, in Denmark. They're not putting out press releases about what the UK government's doing in their countries because they're independent, and that's where we should be headed in Scotland. Finally, Ruth Wishart, uh, you mentioned that earlier you and I should have a campaign to, to persuade our demographic, let's put it that way, that they should rally behind the independence cause. Uh, and you're quite right, of course, that has been the section of the community most resistant to the independence message. Have you any formula for, for achieving that conversion, Ruth? Well, it's not so much a formula, I think, as, as a, a, the underpinnings of a proper campaign. One of the things that my demographic, I think, um, when my demographic is, thanks for the thought, Alec, but my demographic's uh, a bit senior to yours, it's... I think what we have to do is persuade them that their very real concerns are not well founded. I mean, it's it's perfectly fair for people on fixed incomes, and that fixed income is a, a, a really impoverished pension. It's perfectly fair for them to say, hang on, I need to be sure because I haven't got much of an income anyway, and I need to be sure it's safe. That's absolutely fair. It's absolutely fair for people to say, oh, hang on. How much food do we get from down south? Will I still be able to feed my family? That is perfectly fair as well. We have to address these issues head on. We have to do the research, do the hard yards and address these issues and give people proper answers and, and give people proper, you know, just give them uh, a, a, a bit of uh, an indication that we've done the, the, our homework on this. So far, I think the people who've done the homework haven't been the Scottish government. Lots of people have done lots of hard work <laughs> We've got to um, get together, we've got to hammer out um, the answers to these very, very pertinent questions which people are entitled to ask, and then we go on the road and we say, no, don't worry, because if you want a more socially just, more equitable, better future, it has to be an independent Scotland. Ruth Wisher, independent journalist, and Angus Brendan McNeil, independent member of parliament. Thank you so much for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thanks, Alex. Alex. Hi, I'm Joanna Cherry, the Scottish National Party Member of Parliament for Edinburgh South West. I like a good debate and I like to win. So if you want to see me help Alex Salmon's team, you give David Davis' team the sort of trouncing I gave Boris Johnson at the UK Supreme Court, then come along to the eyes have it, the eyes have it. We're going to be on at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe at the Spiegel Tent from the 4th of August to the 13th.
Now, one of the recurrent themes of these programmes is to look at Scotland's past with a view to informing our present and guiding our future. So when we come to a debate on Scotland's constitution, Scottish sovereignty, legal opinion, Scotland's right to decide, where better to look than the, the fountainhead of Scottish sovereignty, of constitutional thought, the Declaration of Arbroath of, of 1320. Because it was that declaration which established the tradition of the idea of a sovereignty of the people in Scotland, of contractual government. The expression, unique in medieval European society, that if you didn't like what a king does, if he wasn't prepared to defend Scotland, if he was going to sell us out to the English, then we'd get rid of good King Robert and replace him with somebody else. That is the fountainhead of the constitutional tradition of Scotland, of the sovereignty of the people, which has run like a, a golden thread throughout our history. So what uh, does that mean for, for, for today? Well, one of the lessons from the Declaration of 1320 is that Bruce and his allies had already won in Scotland. They didn't go to the equivalent then of the United Nations, the, the papacy in Avignon, and say, make us independent. They said, look, we've already won. We want you to recognize our independence. And therefore today, in my view, that's how we should regard the international community. Going to the international community doesn't absolve us of the responsibility of winning the battle in Scotland. It's when you've won that battle, you go to the international community for recognition of your rights and your independence. And secondly, the, the declaration famously was written not just in the, the name of the, the, the nobles, the barons, it was written by the prelates or, or, the, or the fiefholders and freeholders of Scotland. It was also written in the name of the whole community of the realm. And that gave it its power and significance because it introduced the idea of a community beyond the, the usual actors of the, the feudal state. It was an idea that there was an entity such as Scotland. And so when we think about where Scotland and how Scotland should move forward now, we think about it in the same terms. We need the support of the community of the realm, of the nation of Scotland by majority has to decide to exercise its sovereignty. But we need the other actors in as well. And for the barons and the freeholders, you could substitute the members of parliament or the members of the Scottish parliament, those who have been voted into responsible positions to represent Scotland. So if you're advancing the cause of Scotland, you need both. You need the people in elected position and the people expressing their sovereignty to take our case, win it in Scotland, and take our case to the international community through a Scottish convention or some other similar device. Then the people say, well, you know, I don't really trust these politicians. After all, they've done absolutely nothing for the, for the last eight years. They haven't exercised their mandate. Well, there again, of course, the, the Declaration of 1320 tells you exactly what to do. If the 1320 sealers of the declaration were prepared to get rid of good King Robert, the hero king, if he didn't uh, accede to their wishes and represent Scotland, then the answer is quite clear. If the current representatives of the Scottish people don't exercise the rights of the Scottish nation, don't do what they said they would do when they were standing for election, then get rid of them and elect somebody else in their place who will do that. But to succeed we have to unite the elected representatives of Scotland and the community of the realm, what in modern parlance we call Civic Scotland, to seek, to get, to obtain a mandate in an election for independence and then be prepared to back it up, exercise that mandate and to lead the people. You know, there is a, a popular democratic army in Scotland waiting to be led, but that leadership must be provided in combination by the civic community of Scotland and its elected representatives. That's how you win the battle in Scotland and that's how you win the battle for Scotland through international recognition. So when the Supreme Court says you can only exercise your rights if you're a colony, they're talking nonsense. As Robert McCorkadale said, not in legal terms, but basically compressing what he said, they're up a gum tree. If that was the idea applied internationally, then the United Nations would never have extended from 50 states to almost 200 if the predecessor state could veto the right of a people to self-determination. Scotland, in the streets, in the communities of this realm, is a real nation. Real nations have the right of self-determination. And what we have to find is the opportunity to express it 
and then the will and the determination to enforce it. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode of Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmon. We do hope you have enjoyed the show. And of course, remember you can watch us every Thursday at nine o'clock on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, on Apple Podcasts and indeed Spotify. And don't forget to subscribe for ad-free content, bonus content, a monthly Ask Alex Anything and a special edition of Salmon Speaks just for subscribers only. But for now, from all of us here at the show, myself and Alex, take care and we hope to see you again next week. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.